we've been talking uh, on the last few Thursday nights about how he must increase in our life, how Jesus must increase in our life. And this is our fourth lesson. Actually, this is lesson 3B because we didn't get a lot of time last Thursday uh, to get into this, and we probably would have concluded last week. But So now there's a four-part to the lesson. So praise the Lord for that. But it, as, as we've been going through this, it's good for me, you know, just personally, spiritually, to re- be reminded of the... Uh, of my position or my place, you know, I didn't create this thing. You know, Pastor Tina, you know, often challenges people, you know, when they say, well, I made that thing. She says, well, you didn't make that thing. God made the thing and gave you the elements to make that. You know, you just had a response to what God did. And it's, I mean, I don't know, probably everybody's heard the the old joke um, about the two guys that get together and, and have a debate, and um, the guy says, well, I can do what God did. I could, I could create a man out of the dust of the ground, and he says, well, I don't, I don't think you can do it, but uh, I'll take you up on the wager, and the guy goes, well, let me go, or the guy goes, let me go get some dirt, and he said, well, no, go get your own dirt. God created that, <laughs> you know, so, you know, everything came from God. He is at the, be- the beginning and the basis for all, and since we're not in, you know, serving a religion, there are not rules for us to follow. Somebody said, well, what about the Ten Commandments? Those aren't rules for us. Remember, under the law, the commandments were given to reveal sin. But you know what? When you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you don't want to sin. You don't have to tell me that I, don't have, I can't commit adultery. I don't want to commit adultery. That seed's not on the inside of me. I want to love my wife. I mean, I don't have to worry uh, about Eugene trying to rip me off. No, because the seed's not in there. Because when you have a relationship with Jesus Christ, you're not serving a religion. You're not reserving rules and regulations and telling me how I have to do it. And, you know, um, you know I, I mean, think about it. When you fall in love with Jesus, you realize, you know, I want to be modest. I want to be temperate. I want to love everybody because he loved me. I mean, the world may not have seen that I was in a miry pit. My life may have looked really good. I mean, some of them superstars in Hollywood, their lives look good. But they're shooting themselves up with heroin and ODing and and dying. And you think, man, they've got the whole world. Well, that's the problem. They've got the whole world. And the thing that they're missing is Jesus. And so he needs to become more prominent in my life. And so as I, as I study, it's like, how? How do I glorify you and lift you up? Because he gave me the promise that if we would lift him up, if he would become more prominent in our life, he would draw all men to himself. And he does that through us. So let's go over to John 14, 11 again. John 14, 11. It says, Jesus says, believe me that I am in the Father and the Father in me, or else believe me for the sakes of the works themselves. See, the more we get into Jesus, the more we get into the Father. And the things that we do then become manifest to this world. They see the love. They see the compassion. They see the peace. They see the overcoming. They see all of what God is doing in our life. And we are different to them then. Father, I want to be different. I thank you, Lord, that as we pursue you, as we pursue you, let us do so humbly, knowing that everything that we have comes from you. That as we decrease in our own desires, our lusts, our our, our selfish inward needs, but focus more outwardly to you and to this world, Father, that you are glorified and supply all of our wants, all of our uh, daily needs, all of our daily bread is supplied to us. And we thank you for that, Father, and give you glory and honor in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we looked at uh, John chapter 3, verse verse 30, where John the Baptist talked about the fact that he had to decrease. I mean, he was the big guy on the scene. Remember, he was baptizing people in the Jordan River, and they were coming to him in flocks. 
But after Jesus got baptized by John, John's disciples were getting nervous, you know, because Jesus' um, you know, business was getting busier. You know, his, his food truck, everybody was going there, and they weren't eating at John's location anymore. You know what I mean? And so his, this John's disciples were getting nervous, and John said, hey, this is a good thing. I must decrease. He must increase to, the, to God's glory. And so we can, we can find our significance by losing ourself. Because, see, significance is not measured by notoriety, rather by the value you contribute to others. Significance is the humble, quiet, peaceful assurance and trust in the destiny God has for you. True significance flows from God. And so that's what we've talked about the last three weeks. And we got over a little bit into Colossians chapter 1, verses 10 through 12. So let's go over there again tonight. And let's, uh, let's dig into this a little bit and see if we can pull some nuggets about of what Paul was trying to communicate to the church in um, Coloss. All right? Colossians 1, verse 10. That you may walk worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing Him. And then we stopped there and we looked at the Gospel of John chapter 14 and chapter 15. Where where Jesus basically hearkened back uh, about how to please Him. How to walk worthy of Him. And to get right down to the nuts and bolts of it, He said, it's through obedience. If you love me, keep my command. Do what I've, I've showed you. What I've taught you, what I've told you, if you really love me. He said, man, I am in the Father and the Father's in me. And if you love me, do what I told you to do. The number one problem I have in life, and probably you do in, in life, is not obeying what Jesus taught us to do. You know, when, when I find scarcity in my life, I can look back and see where, where I've missed Following what God has taught me to do. There's a, pro, there's a, a scripture in, in Proverbs. It says, the hand of the diligent maketh rich. Right? But it also says, the hand of the slothful leads to poverty. And, if, and Bob Harrison says it like this. You, find the, you see the lack, you follow it back to the slack, and you'll identify your problem. It's the same way in our life. If we, are, if we have a deficiency somewhere in our life, we follow back to where we got out of God's will or didn't follow Him. I'm not talking about a tax, but I'm following Him. And we can find the scarcity. And, and you know, I know, how many generations did my family, you know, struggle financially? But then one day I found out I didn't have to be poor anymore. What a great day that was. Now, it, in the flesh, it would have been nice if the day after I had found that, I would have driven home and a Brinks truck would have been in the driveway. That would have been nice. But that's not the way it works. I had to get to where I put Jesus first, put Scott down here, and as I did and I began to walk and understand, then the principles begin to flourish with the promise. You know, Aaron was talking about it at offering time. You know, the first time that, that you heard, you know, that God loves a cheerful giver, you thought, well, great, I'm cheerful and I'm giving. You know, but when you sowed for six months and didn't see the harvest yet, you know, that doubt starts to reign in your mind. But see, we don't walk by sight, we walk by faith. And so I've heard many people say, well, I tried that faith thing. I tried that giving thing. I, I, I did that giving thing. I sowed for two, three years. I didn't see anything from it, so I, I don't think it really works. Well, if you're still having financial issues in your life, you've got to go back and see what you're not doing according to God's word. His word says, whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. Give, and it'll be given unto you, good measure, pressed down, shaken together. You know, and, and this goes in. I mean, if you're having problems in the area of relationships, you may not be sowing love. You may not be sowing, show, 
sowing happiness. Zig Ziglar used to always say, give a smile away, they're free. You know, it's interesting how many times that you see somebody walking down the hallway, especially in hospitals, and they've got just, I mean, they, and you smile at them, and all of a sudden their eyes brighten and they smile back. They're like, somebody cares. You know, some, there's, you know, and as you start to sow that type, that in your life, you will start to reap the reward of that. So, Jesus first, or Paul basically, say, basically says, hey, go back to what Jesus taught us. Go back to the scriptures that the Lord had shared with us that we need to walk worthy of his commands. Jesus said, if you love me, you'll do what I told you. And I love him, so I want to do more about what he's told me to do. So fully pleasing him. And then it says, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. And so the fruitful comes after the pleasing him. You notice that? The fruitful comes after pleasing him and then increasing in the knowledge of God. Why is this important? In Matthew 6, what does it say? Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things will be added unto you. Well, what things? Whatever you need. He says, look at the birds of the field, man. They don't sow, but they reap. And consider the lilies of the field. And even Solomon with all his money aren't arrayed as gloriously as one of them. He's saying, if you seek God first, the things that, that the world's pursuing will be added unto you. And you know what? When they come from God, they come with peace. Right? He doesn't add sorrow with it. It comes with the blessing of God upon it. In Hebrews eleven six, without faith it's impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a what? A rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Well, what does that mean? Does that mean you're, you're playing hide and seek with him? No, it means you're finding him in his word and finding what he has told us to do and doing it. Pretty simple. So we're fruitful to ever, every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God and the pursuit of making Jesus bigger. And by making him bigger, we're emptying ourselves out of ourself. The more we empty ourselves out of ourself, you know what? Your road rage level goes down. Your irritability with employees or coworkers goes down. You even can tolerate family at Thanksgiving dinner with joy. I mean, you can. I mean, I don't know about you, but I've got some doozies in my family. Right, mom and sis? I know you're probably watching tonight, but we do. I mean, everybody does. It's just the nature of, of you know, the, the world. All right, so verse 11. I want you to catch this. I'm going to read verse 11 first, and we're going to go back. It says, Strengthened with all might, according to his glorious power, for all patience, long suffering with joy. So let's go back here. It says, Strengthen. This word here, dunamo, comes from the, the Greek root word dunamis. Okay? This word strengthen means enable. I guess the best example would be you take a, you take a um, well, let's just say, let's just take dynamite because the, the word for dynamite comes from the word dunamis, okay? So we take dynamite and you put the igniter on it, right? With the dynamite and the igniter on it, it is not enabled. But when you engage the igniter, now it is enabled. So when it's saying strengthened, it means that it has made you able. Able to what? Able to channel dunamis or explosive power. So strengthened with all might. This word might is dunamis. It is the Greek word that we find in uh, Acts 1.8. That says, tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued with power from on high. It's 
the word dunamis. It's the same word that we find in Ephesians chapter 3. It is the explosive power of God. It is the miracle working power of God. So first you must be enabled or strengthened or enabled with this dunamis according to his glorious power. This word power is the Greek word kratos. Now, if you're not familiar with the word kratos, kratos is the word for power demonstrated. It is the effectual demonstration of power. So, um, Jesus standing at Lazarus' tomb. And he says, Lazarus, come forth. And Lazarus goes from being dead to being alive. That power that caused that resurrection to life is the kratos or the demonstrated power. This is Jesus demonstrating that I have the power of life and the resurrection. So he's saying, hey, look, when you pursue me, when you love me, when you put me first in, in, in your life and do what I told you to do, then I will put you, I'll enable you, I'll make you a vessel that is capable of being filled with this dunamis, miracle-working, explosive power so that you can kratos to the world, so that you can show it off to the world. Now, now we're not showing it off like, hey, bring everybody in here, and and, and I'm going to lay hands on this leper, and you're going to see what great power I have. No. But it's where you, find, where you run into somebody who, is, who is, says, man, you know what, I can't hardly lift my arm anymore. And you say, you know what, I believe Jesus Christ wants to heal that. Just like John and Peter did when they were going into to the, the temple. And they looked down at the man and, and he looked up as to receive, to receive an alm from him. And they said, silver and gold we do not have, but what I have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ. Rise. That's the kratos. They demonstrated the power of God in their life. Why? Because they were enabled with the dunamis. And that's what Paul is saying here. He's saying, hey, let's be fully pleasing to God by getting the full knowledge of God and increasing then in our an, a, ability in order to exercise the dunamis that we, were, um, that we were granted. And now let's make a show for God's sake. Let's glorify Him. Let's make Him great. According to the power for all patience and long suffering with joy. And we know that James says, Let patience have its perfect work, that you be complete, lacking nothing. See, by becoming peaceful and patient, we glorify Him and we become stronger in ourselves. Why? Because we become more like Him. I mean, our flesh does not want to be patient. I mean, I don't know about you, but my flesh doesn't want to be patient. But I've got to train my flesh to be patient. I've got to be able to rest in tribulation. Isn't that what Jesus did? Remember, he got into a boat, put his head down on a pillow, and he said, boys, take me to the other side. Did Jesus have any thought about not getting to the other side? Not one. He didn't care about the storm. Jesus, wake up. Don't you care that we're about to die? And he says, why are you so afraid? I was sleeping. If you'd have just let me sleep, I would have been at the other shore. If you had to grab hold of my foot and come along with me as I floated on the water, you should have done that. But you should have been in peace. With patience and long suffering, which means that this this word here, macrometho, means through through the trials and tribulations. We don't we we suffer long or we endure with pressureful patience. With joy. And Aaron shared Nehemiah 8:10. I mean, even in the Old Testament, God told them through the prophet. The joy of the Lord will be your strength, man. Don't lose hold of this joy that I've put into you. 
I love that song. This joy that I found. The world didn't give it to me. The world doesn't give you joy. You know, the, the world may make you laugh and, and give you some humor and that kind of stuff, but it doesn't give you joy. Joy is what happens at midnight when it, when it seems like the world's coming around on you. Every bill collector's after you. Every thing that could go wrong could go wrong, and you still got joy. Because you can't steal my joy. And if you can't steal my joy, you can't steal my goods. And I can tell you this, if you won't faint under the pressure, eventually the devil's going to give up and pack up his bags and go home because he's going to go find somebody who will get into confusion and stress and doubt and unbelief. Why? Because you refuse to do anything but to exalt Jesus. Well, don't you know you're being sued? Not my problem, it's his problem. Don't you know that the economy's gone bad? It's not my problem, it's his problem. I believe. I believe. Ecclesiastes 11, 2. It says, give a serving to seven, and yea, also to eight. For you do not know what troubles will be upon the earth. That means I'm going to do over in abundance right now. I'm going to continue to give into every good work. And when troubles come upon the earth, guess what? It won't affect me. Why? Because he's in charge. When the troubles come upon the earth, I'm going to still walk in patience. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I shall fear no evil. Why? Because you're comforted with joy. Giving thanks to the Father who has qualified us. He has qualified us. What do you mean he's qualified us? Well, we went through the qualifications. We found out how to become well-pleasing. We allowed him to, through, through, through the spiritual enrichment or, or development, allowed him to enable us with his deutimous power so that his kratos would work in our life. And therefore, we are qualified to go and be ministers of reconciliation. And that's how you can pray the prayer that the early church prayed in Acts chapter 4, saying, Father, look on their threats and grant to your servants that with all boldness we may speak your word. With signs and wonders following in the name of your holy servant, Jesus Christ. Because I've been qualified. Because I've, I've, I've put Jesus first. I put him first in my life. I've become less. It's not about what Scott wants. It's about what Jesus wants. You know, and it's a process. I mean, because there's some days I get up and Scott wants some things. You know, but I am learning just like you day by day in order to, to crucify this flesh with its passions and its desires that God would gain the glory so that every success would be for his glory. <laughs> He's qualified us to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in the light. He increases in our lives as we decrease. Jump down with me to verse 15. Let's read verse 15 through 18. He is the image of the invisible God. He's the firstborn over all creation. If there's a firstborn, there was a secondborn. So you're a secondborn or thirdborn or fourthborn. He was the firstborn over all creation. For by him, all things were created in heaven and that are on the earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones, dominions, principalities, or powers. All things were created through him, and they were created for him. They were created for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things consist. He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in all things he may have preeminence. He gets preeminence. He gets first place. He is in the beginning, because in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God. And when we go back to Genesis 1, we see in the beginning God, Elohim. That word is plural for, for a reason. It describes God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And by the time you get down to Genesis 1.26, it says, We made God in our image, and we said He was good. He looked at them. He created them male and female. We created them. God did that. He is our all. And that's religion can't, can't give you that. Relationship can. This is where we get in and understand and, and say, 
I don't know how, but I know who. And I'm going to let the world know the who. I'm going to let them know that it's because of what God has done in my life. I had an opportunity to be interviewed about, well, I guess it's been 25 years ago on, on our local television uh, where we were living in Washington State. Uh, at that time, we had a successful computer company, and I don't remember whether we had two or three computer stores at that time, but we were the largest in the county. Uh, our, and uh, we got asked to come on and, and do an interview. And um, when they asked, what can you attribute your success to? Oh, my. I'm a born-again believer. And I believe that God has called me into business. And I give him all the glory. What Jesus has done in my life. And I got to share that testimony on television. I mean, that's awesome. Powerful. Letting people know that, hey, I'm in this for a purpose. I'm not in this for the money. I mean, you're in business to make money, but I'm not in it for the money. I'm in it for the kingdom. I'm in this for the kingdom. When God calls you to something, there's a kingdom opportunity. And when you get in it for the kingdom, it doesn't matter what the, the balance sheet says. You know, you are successful if you're doing kingdom things. God takes care of the balance sheets. Always is taking care of mine. Let's close with this. Let's go over with me to Philippians 2.9. Philippians 2.9. Philippians 2.9, Paul writes, Therefore, God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name. And Paul writes about this in Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. How God gave him a name, set him at his own right hand in heavenly places. In chapter 2, he talks about that he set him over all principalities and powers. And he put you right with him. And then he empowered you in chapter 3. And gave you the exceeding abundance of his glory. And then it works according to the power that works in you. The more that you don't want, don't need, don't want, don't strive for the power, the more power comes. I mean, I, I, the, great, the greatest falls I've seen in Christian ministers are, are people striving for power, trying to become something great on their own. But you know what? The humble men of God. Um, I can see his face, but his name just jumped out of me. From England, the minister in the 189 Wigglesworth, Smith Wigglesworth. It's one of the things. He was a plumber. But he believed God. And he says, what I hear God tell me to do, I do it. And then he would go back home to his humble place. He wasn't trying to be anything great. But if you look back over the last hundred years, you won't find another ministry that had any more power and operation than his did. He made Jesus the center of everything that he did. See, when we understand that it is him who is highly exalted, I'm just glad that he lets me hang around, you know what I mean? And the longer I'm with him, I am so honored just to be able to hang around. And the more I hang around and follow his words, the more he just keeps doing things for me. I mean, it's exceeding, it's abundant, and it's above whatever I, things I could even think. To him be the glory. Amen. Father, we thank you. I thank you, Lord, that as we are in the pursuit of, of you. Let our lives exalt you before men, that you would draw men to you. I thank you, Father, that the casual benefit is that you have provided us a God kind of life.
but I would do anything for you because of what you have done for us. You have created us in your own image. And when we couldn't handle the responsibility of stewardship, you sent your only son to save us, to restore our spiritual lives in relationship with you. We truly do give you all the praise and all the honor because you're deserving of all the glory. This we say in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.